Can people hear me okay? I had a flu a couple of weeks back and my voice isn't fully recovered, so it's probably, but, it, but with the mic it's okay? Okay, all right. Well, for a while, I, I should have come and done it about two weeks ago because I had a total Leonard Cohen kind of, you know, bass level voice. It was, I could have been a radio DJ for about two weeks of my life when I had this thing in the start, but yeah, now it's sort of normalizing. Probably should have that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Ready to go? Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right, so um, this is all about um, citywide reality capture using a particular approach that's used by a number of companies um, is sort of using a vehicle to drive it with spherical uh, cameras and capture both you know photorealistic imagery plus lidar at that scale and um, the integration issues around using it within Autodesk products and also thinking about how such a workflow and how such a kind of data collection uh, methodology fits into the bigger picture of collecting data at the full city scale, but also for specific projects. Um, so we're going to talk uh, about the issues in general and the current you know, collection trends, and most of which many of you will know. And then we're going to talk about specifically a tool we've used with uh, Pete, who now works for a company called Cyclomedia. They're a Dutch company that has a US operation. And uh, they have a really kind of uh, borderline revolutionary approach to it that has some uh, fantastic tools and APIs that you can use. I'd like to thank Sean Kinahan, who's our developer here. He's did a lot of the work on uh, the product that we have that uh, links the two together. And uh, then we'll just conclude with some final thoughts on uh, priorities and challenges that we faced uh, putting this in place. Um, so that's about essentially the class summary. Uh, so hopefully you'll come away understanding, you know, what specifically this kind of method of data collection and capture can do to reduce costs and uh, increase quality of the data you're collecting. Um, it can show you how the photorealistic aspect of the LiDAR, of, of the data plus the LiDAR together can um, be really great for measuring for new projects and for engineering. Um, <clears throat> we'll learn specifically how to use it in AutoCAD Civil 3D. It works essentially, our plugin works in all versions of AutoCAD. We have a prototype that's working in Revit, um, and uh, we were unsuccessful in getting our thing to work in InfraWorks. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and so that last one, which is what we sort of originally pitched for this class, we did not fulfill that, and I'll explain a little bit why uh, toward the end. So bios. So uh, Stephen Brockwell, that's me. Um, I worked for a company called, well, actually I started, there's some ArcGIS, uh, ESRI folks in the room here. I started working at Stats Canada in 87 doing automated districting on Vax VMS, if you can believe it, with ArcInfo 3. And uh, that was like just an incredibly wonderful, challenging project. So uh, welcome to the ESRI folks in the room who really defined this space, you have to say, the, the geospatial uh, you know, space, really. Anyway, and then uh, we had a company in Ottawa that was building their own sort of 100% Oracle-based GIS system called Vision. And I joined that. That was acquired by Autodesk. I was uh, director of product management there for a number of years with Map Civil 3D and then uh, moved into a sales role, and then started to sort of say, hey, I would like to do this on my own, and started a small company called Brockwell IT, where we do consulting with utilities, telecoms, municipalities, just in you know broad terms about how to strategically plan data collection, design, engineering efforts, and also specific implementations around this kind of technology. Pete, please introduce yourself. 
I didn't actually do the uh, bio because I was silly and I didn't get it into, uh, into Stephen in time. So whatever Stephen's written up there, I believe it to be the truth and I haven't seen it so I can't really comment on it. Pete Southwood, the accent by the way is from England so please don't wonder what part of Australia I'm from because I'm English. So we'll get that out of the way to begin with. Uh, formerly with a company called Autodesk, 20 years, uh, predominantly as the uh, early stage of my career there was the GIS evangelist for Autodesk. But in the last 16, 17 months I've been working for a company called Cycler Media based in Berkeley. I'll let the solution and how it interacts with the Autodesk based solutions uh, speak for itself a little later on. Um, but I've had an interesting uh, juxtaposition over the last uh, almost two years where I've pr not predominantly been dealing with Autodesk customers but actually in the last two years it's been almost solely Esri customers. So it's, it's nice to actually be in both camps. Both huge amount of value on both sides. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what else you put no, in there. That's fine. That's I think that's fine. I'm going to sit down. Essentially, you, you know, like me, Pete has been doing GIS things and sort of founding companies like Convergent, being a founding partner in that for 30 years or so. So he's been around. He was an Ask Pete. Uh, he had his own sort of, you know, kind of blog and, you know, he was someone that people would go to inside the customer base to get solutions to problems with Autodesk GIS uh, world uh, for a long time. So he was, he's a great resource that's been uh, a great colleague for, for many years. So I'm glad to be doing this with you. Thank you. Me too. Okay. So typical options for collecting this kind of stuff. Most of us know them. I mean, all of the technology out there to do it is ubiquitous. But the key thing is uh, asset management, it's incredibly useful. I mean, you know, sending crews to the field back and forth with web apps and phones is fine. It can be very expensive. It can be uh, somewhat unpredictable. Data quality can be variable. Um, but, uh, and even, you know, like data collection techniques, like some people will get GPS coordinates close, some, you know, have different level of skill sets in collecting that data. So there's some issues there, but uh, asset management, which is becoming more and more critical, I'll give you a quick case in point, which is what drove this uh, customer project that this is based on. City of Alexandria, Louisiana has um, fire rating which is uh, at risk of changing because their collection data on hydrants is inadequate and out of date. So they don't know the full inventory of their hydrants. They don't know the fire flow at each hydrant. And they don't know the quality and the age and all of the conditions of the piping that is feeding all those hydrants. So as a result of that, they're at risk of dropping one or two fire insurance ratings, which could mean you know, liability problems and also just vastly increased insurance payments and especially serious problems if there were an incident. So that's what's driven Alexandria to embark on a really massive data collection effort. And that fundamentally is an asset management problem at the full city scale. So that's the kind of thing uh, we're talking about here. But also planning, uh, assessment. Pete will go into some of the details here. Emergency management as well and public safety. Um, you know, our right of ways being obeyed, our, you know, their encumbrances to pedestrians, to traffic, these kinds of things. This is a perfect way to sort of do a kind of objective survey where you can intervene and look at the state of affairs at a certain point in time from a kind of you know, desktop or mobile environment, but not have to be in the field at that location to get the very close picture of the reality of the site you're working on. Uh, transportation and road condition assessment, that's another major opportunity that we're working on together. Cycle Media has actually already closed that opportunity um, in the city of New York for one of the applications there is uh, pavement marking data quality. So the pavement mark, well not the data quality, the quality of the pavement markings. Some of which as you'll see here uh, for DC area too, you can see in temporal view the difference in quality year over year. <coughs> So the data that is available now, there's a, there's a workflow to collecting it, to putting it together, to stitching it, and then to making it available. So that tends to be, you know, a sort of cumbersome and time consuming process, especially at this full city scale. It's not bad at a project level, like let's say you're doing a substation, a water plant or something, some single specific project, it tends to be perfectly fine. But at the full city scale to get a decent, consistent data quality, uh, across the whole thing can be an extremely expensive and time-consuming operation. And I want to emphasize the time-consuming part because a lot of the 
you know, a lot of municipalities they just don't have resources to get into the field so that at a certain point in time, like within a window of a week or a month or something like that, they can get the whole city inventoried from a high quality LIDAR point of view. Uh, that's just not something they have the resources to do. They wouldn't have the people they could send into the field to get that done in a timely fashion. Uh, the imagery processing can be time consuming and cumbersome and you need often very expert resources to be able to do that. Uh, and often those are not available or you hire an engineering contractor to do that for you. Um, so, uh, at the end of the day, you've got, you know, perfectly fine solution using this technique for small areas or pockets that you're assembling, but not necessarily one that is at the full scale. Um, <clears throat> the other aspect of this is, of course, you know, the limits of the point cloud data that you're dealing with. And this is going to turn out to be one of the challenges that I talk about at the end of it, because um, for just the city of Alexandria, which is about 80,000 people, uh, there were 100,000 or more, I think it's 300,000, which is going to shrink because we're changing the size, the tile size, but 100,000 files of recap data, if you can imagine, right? So if you had to manually process that recap data, you would never finish. So there's a tool we'll talk about later that allows you to do that, but fundamentally processing that volume of LiDAR data is something that is really difficult or if not impossible for a municipal scale organization uh, to undertake. And again, this second you know, part here, you know, the positioning and you know, data consistency, different people, different crews doing it are gonna get different data qualities. How you reconcile those data qualities? How do you ensure that the measurements that you're getting off of the resulting data are going to be accurate and uh, reflect ground truth in a consistent way across the municipality? And then again, the stitching. One of the nice things about what we've got here, as you see, when you navigate in AutoCAD, it's pretty seamless. So you're going from spherical image to spherical image, and uh, you know, um, it's fairly continuous and seamless, and it has incredibly extensive metadata about it too. Okay, so these are the familiar ways of doing it, of course. Um, you know, terrestrial uh, data capture, drones, which are actually really useful in concert with this. Because the one thing is when you drive uh, your collection, you're looking up, which is incredibly useful. I'll show a screenshot of how in Civil 3D you can actually capture the underside of a bridge or an overpass um, and take measurements of that, right? So that, un that street level view is incredibly useful, but it, it's not giving you the roof, it's not giving any assets that are on the roof, any kind of uh, other things that are on the aerial level, antennas and that kind of thing. So, it's important that, that you look at this not as a single mechanism of doing it, but as a sort of really great baseline mechanism for establishing in a very cost-effective way, I want to emphasize that, a complete ground truth for the entire city um, that is uh, affordable and uh, usable across a wide range of applications, but it's not necessarily complete. It's not to say, you know, gaps where, you know, there's large parkland and these kinds of things. Um, it's not, it doesn't give you, it gives you a full picture of the drivable area, not the entire city. So aerial uh, LIDAR and other things, it's, a, it's part of a whole picture. <coughs> now there are other solutions for this and we have done some work with, uh, with them. So Google Street View has a really kind of uh, cool API. It's extremely easy to implement and put into AutoCAD or anything. Doesn't, if you have any Object ARX type developers or Autolist developers, it's actually really easy to do. Um, but it's limited in functionality. The metadata that they have inside Google Street View is kind of limited to, yes, there's data there, and this is where it is. It's not data quality metrics that are in there. It's not um, kind of pickable, measurable uh, imagery that you can use in that way. But it does give you sort of a site level view of what's going on. Um, it also isn't as inexpensive as you might think. So. Um, you know, if you're going to use it on a large scale for large scale projects, you can end up, um, you know, sort of spending money for data that you don't control the collection of. You can't control when it was collected and you don't necessarily know the vintage and whether certain data was collected at certain points in time. But it is still a viable uh, approach. So Cyclomedia has a really unique way to go in to do it. I'm not going to get into all the details, but um, Panoramas they have are incredibly detailed. They're about the highest density of any uh, vendor in the industry. 
And the way they represent the application to uh, partners and developers, uh, of course, ESRI is one of them. They have uh, some really great integrations um, on that platform, as well as now AutoCAD Map. So the th kinds of things you can do with this data are really pretty impressive. So I'll let Pete take over from here, and then I'll come back to talk about uh, some of the implementation details. Thanks, Stephen. This, this isn't meant as a commercial for Cycle Media, but I think it's just important to uh, highlight what we do as an organization. Uh, Berkeley-based, fairly young in the United States, but what we do is capture professional-grade street-level imagery. And I want to just share a couple of examples. Our guests from ESRI, you might sort of recognize the screen. There we've got uh, ArcGIS. I don't recognize it. The screen is ArcGIS. Um, Online, thank you. Who said online? Good man. ArcGIS Online, uh, but more importantly, just emphasizing the client itself. Uh, in this particular case, customer is Washington, D.C., DDOT. D about four years ago, they decided they wanted to capture the whole of D.C. to manage their Department of Transportation-based assets. So full, uh, complete uh, asset capture for the city. Now, in this particular case, they were so enthralled with the imagery, they've continued capturing every year for the last four years. And this year alone, they actually requested that we um, capture information about the street level imagery. Sorry, street level signage, that might be better. So using our imagery, we actually extracted 350,000 street signs that matched with the MUTCD database, the National Signage Database. DDOT actually thought they had over a million signs. So now we're getting into this situation where we have this real world situation, a real world source of truth, where you've got an organization that actually thought and budgeting around certain assets, but in reality, they're considerably less. They also took on board parking meters and parking bays. So just in the way of Washington, D.C., street sign inventory, but taking it further through to I should have practiced this. Is it a shift key or an enter key? Uh, hit enter. Enter. That's what I thought I did. The animation's not working on that one. Uh, let's. There we go, down arrow, even better. But in one of Stephen's previous slides, he talked uh, to organizations wishing to recoup, recover costs. Now, I've got to be very sort of, sort of sensitive talking about this, but a number of our customers actually use the imagery to reassess properties around the United States. Anyone here live in, anywhere here lives in Maricopa County? I know you too, but well done. Well, your taxes, unfortunately, are assessed based upon our street level imagery. So I'll buy you a drink later, but I'm not sure I can make up for a whole amount of uh, taxes. But this is an, an interesting screenshot of an important integration. This is actually the uh, Esri's um, tax assessor uh, solution that comes out of Esri Canada. And our little contribution is this tiny little bit on the bottom right corner of the screen. The rest of it are coming from pictometry, other vendors of oblique and orthophotography. But putting that source of truth together this is where Brockwell IT does that extremely well, pulling the source of truth together that people like auditors, tax assessors, can actually go through that process of recovering tax dollars. We do other special things, but I just wanted to highlight that for you. Not so special, unfortunately, is when we get into situations like this, understanding that real world source of truth. A couple of years ago, I think it was two years ago, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo in Alberta, I've got to get that right, uh, the township of Fort McMurray had a pretty awful, was it classified as a natural disaster? It was, absolutely. It was one of the worst national disasters, most expensive in uh, certainly Alberta history. Yeah. A number of homes were destroyed because a, a wildfire went through. By the way, I live just south of... Uh, a place called Napa in Sonoma counties. We had a, just a little fire a, a month or so back, similar sort of carnage that, that happened. But we were asked to actually drive this by uh, the township because they wanted to have a full understanding of what was actually physically left. Show us. We need to understand this because guess what? All sorts of 
respectfully crazies come out of the woodwork. Well, you know, I lost my Ferrari because it was burnt and you know, the, the Canadian equivalent of FEMA having to deal with all sorts of different requests for help and money. But truly, what, what's happened there? And also taking this situation, because there's a lot of contaminants here, they're having to re remove all sorts of information, uh, remove all sorts of terrible stuff that's there, contaminants from properties and all sorts of things. So it's having that source of truth, understanding exactly what's going on within that environment. Um, with some minor irony, we as a company captured a place called Monroe County one week before a, an event called Hurricane Irma went screaming through. And if you know Monroe County, anyone here from Florida? Monroe County is from Key Largo down to Key West. So we were actually engaged by the county to actually usual things where they're looking at assessment and looking at all sorts of different departments, public works, to understand what assets they have within the county. And about a week, week and a half later, Irma went screaming through. So what we have now is a complete record of pre-Irma. And they want us to go back in and look at post-Irma because again, the, I shouldn't say that, but the crazies are coming out the... Absolutely. It's, uh, it's Absolutely. You mic'd, by the way, because you're coming up with some valid observations, but please mic. So if I may, I'm just going to, like I said, it's not a commercial, but I'd like to just spend 10 minutes helping you understand how we actually go through that process of capturing street-level imagery. Stephen quite rightly mentioned Google Street View. Fantastic solution. Please be careful around the licensing because you can use it, but... It can be not as cost effective as you th thought, but there are other ways, again, Stephen alluded to them with sort of hero handheld based cameras through to drones and such like. We use things slightly differently. Uh, we use almost exclusively Ford Escapes. Uh, we have a bespoke um, five camera system that sits on top of the vehicle, GPS, IMUs, so we understand if the vehicle's tipping over on its side. We run dead reckoning. We actually drill into the axle of the vehicle. So if we can't get proper GPS coverage, uh, for example, we've just um, captured the five boroughs of New York. Urban canyons can cause problems with GPS coverage. So we actually drill into the axle of the vehicle and can run on dead reckoning. So speed, distance, and things like this. So getting that sort of calibration of the imagery straight off the bat, the driver sits in a vehicle. He follows, or she follows, Pac-Man. He's following the screen uh, for the recording. Obviously, me holding up my hand, pretending <laughs> to be a Pac-Man, um, but follows a, the route on the screen and just captures the imagery that the client wants. So the camera on the top, we capture it, by the way, every... Uh, 15 feet, approximately 5 meters, and you'll see that imagery in play in the integration with the AutoCAD-based solutions momentarily. But imagine that's our recording location. I mentioned the five cameras on top of the vehicle. Each of those, as they pass over that one recording location, takes top, left, right, top, left, right, front and back images. We take those images, and we don't stitch them, but we've got algorithms to actually pull the images together. So when you're looking at other solutions, just, just be aware. Anyone ever seen Google Street View with crooked people, crooked buildings, parallax? None of that occurs in our particular environment. So we take those captured images, we stitch them. I shouldn't use the word stitch because you don't actually physically stitch, but take the images together put them together and we end up with our full 360 degree, 180 degree, 106 megapixel, four inch, sub four inch positional accuracy, sub inch measurement accuracy to 19 millimeters. So now imagine this solution in your Autodesk based environment. We've happily been in an Esri environment benefiting from that for a, for a while, being able to deliver that sort of level of 
precision, if you wish, to that, that Autodesk-based desktop solution. Uh, I don't like that image, Stephen. We'll have to change it. My apologies. It, but a, that's all right, but a full 360 image. The fact that I can be in a car, hold my left mouse key, key down, and read the asset tag on the side of a transformer. Being able to validate addresses, being able to measure ramps for ADA compliance. Anyone here going through the ADA saga within their municipality? Slopes percentage average on that slope, areas, things like this. Again, being able to take that imagery and be able to gather all that information from the imagery. At the same time, our camera system can also capture point clouds. There is no, hey, the imagery is more accurate than the point clouds. It's either captured with the imagery or not captured with the imagery. It's purely as per request by the client. Stephen's client at Alexandria, city of Alexandria in Louisiana, required point clouds because they're able to use that to take in to consideration. Rick, you can ask me a question. You hold your hand up. That was good. You don't mind. <laughs> okay. Is it, is it actual LiDAR or is it CODAR? Sorry, repeat that. I'm not sure. I, the is question... Actual, I mean, you're, are you capturing actual LiDAR from the scanner or is it CODAR from the imaging? Right, so the question, are we capturing actual LiDAR or FODAR? I've not heard that. It sounds like false chicken or something like... Furky. It's photographed. Uh, it, it, no, it's proper LiDAR. We oh, use, it? Yeah, we use the Velodyne, high-end oh. Velodyne HD32 and a whole bunch of other number on the back of it, LiDAR unit. It's like a, a very expensive baked bean can that sits on the back of the, of the imagery. Exactly the same positional and measurement accuracy, no different. In fact, what we do is we benefit from the LiDAR imagery um, because we, we do a couple of extra things which benefits uh, recap Autodesk users. And in this particular case, an Esri user using ArcGIS Pro, we're taking that LiDAR, we also incorporate additional attribute information, and in particular, the RGB value. And we get that RGB value from every single pixel on the 106 megapixel image. You're looking at a screenshot of the city of Redlands in California. They've just recently completed. I need to talk to our friends at Esri because you need to benefit from this data too. City of Redlands in California wanted to capture their complete city, including uh, local, uh, the local city of Redlands airports, their water, wastewater plants, things like this. That was uh, Stephen's client's city of Alexandria LIDAR imagery that they took straight into ArcGIS Pro because it had the RGB value, instant colorization. So it, you need to be able to see this on a proper screen, but it almost looks like a photograph. You're dealing with, you can see leaves and bits of dirt. So there's snow on the left side and slightly to the right because I only gave a small subsection of LiDAR, so some of the data is actually missing. And using tools within the Esri platform to actually do line following asset extraction, capture of information. So we capture imagery plus LiDAR. It, like I said, it wasn't necessarily supposed to be a commercial. But more importantly, and maybe in this situation, is taking that same LiDAR with that same RGB value, so you get instant gratification. That sounded wrong, but you know where I'm coming from. Where we're taking that LiDAR into an AutoCAD-based solution and seeing, hey, if there's a stop sign there, guess what? It's a stop sign. It's red. It's got the word stop on it. If it's a tree, it's green. It's maybe got sort of multicolored speckled barks, but you know what you're dealing with. And it's where Brockwell IT bring immense value to this whole workflow in, well, what can you do with this afterwards? Rick, not necessarily just for you, but if anyone's interesting, it is interested. It is the high-end Velodyne unit that's used by the likes of uh, who are the autonomous vehicle companies I should notice? Who are the ones that went in San Francisco that went to Uber? Went to Phoenix, immediately had an accident because somebody T-boned the vehicle. Great. Um, but it, again, you've got the same position accuracy as the imagery, no different. But we have that ability to capture LiDAR on behalf of our clients as well. So I'll leave that there just for a few seconds. Dual return, by the way. So these things just flash through extremely quickly. And truly, the unit itself just looks like an oversized baked bean tin for goodness knows how many hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
So, taking all that lovely imagery, and thanks for not, hopefully, too much of a commercial, but just the fact that there are other ways of extracting <coughs> content from the field that doesn't necessarily need to be a handheld device or a drone. That can complement the whole workflow. Don't get me wrong. I'm not asking you not to do that. But then what can you do with this in Autodesk-based solutions? So, Stephen, I'm going to pass this over okay. to you. All right. Thank you, Peter. Good. Great. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we'll go into the integrations we've done with various different AutoCAD products or Autodesk products. And then uh, we'll talk about sort of just some closing thoughts on uh, experience from this project, what we learned, um, you know, things to, ch to change next time, uh, challenges that, you know, some of you probably had with recap on really large, uh, not individual data sets, it's fine if you have enough memory for a single data set, but processing hundreds or thousands of data sets in an automated fashion is not the easiest thing to do. Um, so, uh, Google Street View, as I said, um, it's, you know, pretty easy to integrate. It's got a very nicely documented JavaScript API. I am providing the link for it there, so I suggest you have a look. It's a really easy to use JavaScript API. With AutoCAD, you can create a form, pop that thing, you know, the JavaScript viewer into a form, and then just uh, use it right there. So this is actually just inside AutoCAD map. Um, and it's fully navigable too, uh, but again, it doesn't have the same quality of measurement tools or um, you know, metadata that allows you to do engineering right off of that um, image. But it's got some of the same features. So for knowing you know, sort of a current state of affairs at a site, that's very useful. So some of our telecom customers use this to sort of see, okay, what's at a particular site? And they, you know, their data is in, you know, different states of repair. So it's not worth it to them. They don't do the same degree of physical engineering that they need to capture uh, the level of detail and imagery that someone would in a municipality. But um, so that's something that's really quite easy to do. And, you know, we can talk to you about how that's done. <coughs> now, within AutoCAD, we put in place a number of different things. So it's a, just a dockable panel um, that has the cyclorama on it. You can see there, there's a measurement being done right on the surface of the pavement. Um, it's integrated inside the Autodesk environment and there's a bunch of tools on it. So um, it's not, there's, the toolbar is not showing there, but uh, there's the toolbar. So you've got you know, the ability to sort of follow. There's a tool that's not showing up in here. Is this one, is this one in a, a video one? No, I don't think it is. Um, but anyway, so you can navigate, you can um, so show the, the view, view cone and shrink it and stretch it inside AutoCAD. You can rotate it in AutoCAD. When you rotate it in there, it stays synchronized. And then you can go into measurement mode, which is where the real power of this uh, comes in uh, for an AutoCAD user. So here, for example, I love this one. I'm glad Sean did this because you see you're measuring the underside of a bridge. So if, let's say you have a concrete condition problem or something like that and you want to get some estimates of the size of that problem and, and what you're going to have to do for it. Or even let's say you want to take the underside of a surface through a 3D model, you can actually do that uh, from there. Um, so that's a great perspective. And there you see the view cone. It's under the overpass there, and you can see um, the, the sort of viewport. So you can stretch that and everything like that. And even though there's multiple cycloramas, so you see here it goes into, there's a you know, depth of field to the image, which is actually quite... Uh, substantial, those measurements can be made right into the de deeper parts of it. So it's actually an incredibly powerful um, tool for that uh, kind of thing. Oh, in this case here, we're creating a circular arc from, uh, for a curb measured right off of the actual imagery and getting both, you know, you can, when you're using the 3D side, the, the image is underpinned by the LiDAR data if you've collected it. So you can actually collect the 3D elevations of those points as well. So it's not just, you're not just collecting 2D vector data, you're actually collecting 3D elements. So this is uh, a, an example of using it in civil 3D. So it gives you a better idea that this is actually in an area where there's no mapping data that's been collected. It's a shopping mall parking lot. But let's say that we wanted to collect alignments and that kind of thing here. Um, and this, this gives you an idea of the user experience. So you just choose which kind of measurement you want to go in. And you can collect surfaces. You can actually collect, measure 3D surfaces off of this, or points for blocks and attributes, text and that kind of thing. Or you can do uh, 2D or 3D vector um, uh, polylines 
And this, in this case here, we're just doing a simple straight alignment uh, from one end to the other. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. And it actually will create a real Sybil 3D alignment right in the, right in the drawing from that. Well, that, at any point in, in any position, they're all unified, right? So it's full 360 orbit from that position. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. He's doing that now. Because, yeah, yeah. No, no. You, so in that one photo, you're measuring into the distance, but using the, you know, the other cycloramas. And you, but you can actually switch to cycloramas, move to the next one to get more precise at the endpoint if you want to do that. And that happens all seamlessly. And it can even be done inside the viewing tool or inside the AutoCAD part, whichever way you want to do it. So may I add? Yeah. Uh, you're hearing a term band around called cycloramas. That's just purely the 360, 180 degree image. That's what we call a, a geo cyclorama. But you hit it exactly right in the head. It's, it's recording locations that are taken every um, 15 feet. Thank you, five meters, thank you, <coughs> roughly. So you can see that's the recording locations of those blue dots. So you can actually pick a different recording location. It becomes particularly useful for clients that have assets that have considerable distance between them. Uh, as an example, San Jose Water, not just banning clients around, but San Jose Water, it was very important for them to know the distance between hydrants. Because they're going in doing remedial work, need to understand the, the materials they needed to go in and put new pipes in, what information, what uh, materials they needed to repair the roads with, things like this. But being able to go between one image and another and just get that, again, sub-inch accuracy measurement. And if feeding civil 3D, as you can see on the right of the screen. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, no, 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 thanks, Pete. Yeah, so this is actual 3D, civil, uh, civil 3D alignment uh, features. We haven't really expanded beyond alignments because alignments are so fundamental. But in principle, that's something we're looking at doing for the future. Um, and you can see how, you know, I mean, you're collecting data here that is very accurate. And the other thing about the cyclomedia data that I really like is it has metadata on your measurements too. So the, you know, the image itself has a certain level of data quality, but every point on it also has a, data, a level of data quality. So it will tell you whether the data quality on the point that you're measuring is sufficient to be able to use it. And that's uh, incredibly important from a, a kind of engineering and design if you're calculating areas or that, that kind of thing. For, forgive me, may I add again? Yeah, please, I yeah. I promise not to be a no, too no, much no, this of a jack-in-the-box. This is the whole idea. On the left side of the screen, it was just above that measuring bar that appeared, you'll see a date. Uh, the, the, Stephen talks about the metadata. It's become actually surprisingly There's important. There's an example. There you go, well, the metadata as yeah. well. It's surprisingly important to organizations that want to use this in litigation. There's some weird things that happen to trees in Washington, D.C. that I didn't know could happen to trees in D.C. Somebody's apartment, you know, the sun doesn't come into the windows because guess what, there's a tree in the way. It's been known that trees disappear over weekends. This truly happens and tiny little urban gardens appear where the tree used to be. So now you've got neighbors complaining there was an oak tree there, it's now gone. The owner of the property complaining, hey, there was never an oak tree there. Because everything's time and date stamped, litigation, hey, there was a tree there, you're lying, you should have got a permit, and such like. So it's, it's actually some strange cases where we're using that for litigation purposes. Stop signs going missing because some drunk has run them over. Question? How long, how long does it take to get this set up? So the question... So the question being, how long does it take to set this up? And I'm repeating the question for the audio uh, people. Good question. Uh, one vehicle, um, on average, can capture 40 linear miles per day. And it captures everything. 40, and we have to abide by speed rules. We don't have drivers just going nuts, <laughs> terrorizing down the road. I shouldn't have said that word. Well, but no, but I mean, it's so, it's so important because if you think about, again, that idea of like having, having consistent data, right? So, you know, I mean, climate conditions, temperature, mm. all of these things, you know, that you're gathering the data at a consistent set, of, at a consistent time, it has a huge impact on the data quality that results from that. So that's really important. Yeah. Go back out and pick up that data 
So the, the question being, and I'll paraphrase, you know, if strange things happen with the vehicle driving along and all sorts, you know, sort of things happen, yes, we, not a commercial, but we quality assure. We make sure that the, the best possible product gets in front of the, of the client. Uh, but we do have crazies. I gotta, do, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm pointing you now, the gentleman sat at the front who's from Cleveland, uh, but Ohio, our drivers in Columbus had to be deputized. And I got a great photograph of a member of the public who is drawing a gun on our driver. So we had to go back and redrive that area because the driver had to move out quickly. <laughs> but people throwing themselves on vehicles, strange things in alleyways in DC, which there's a mixed audience here and I really don't want to go into now. But yeah, we, we get some strange, strange old stuff -o yeah. that we have to go back and re, re record. <laughs> Just to reiterate for what Peter had mentioned about dates too, this, this video sort of clip has been played. But in this image here, at, you can see the, just very briefly see it, because it's too bright, but you see the date at the top of that slider? So you can slide that down, that's what we're doing. And in this case, this is really useful because this is one of the problems, it's pavement markings, right? There were no pavement markings here the year before, and they've put them in, right? So they can say, yeah, that problem has been addressed. Um, and that, so that ability to do temporal examination of, the, of your data and then measure differences, right, between last year and this year for degradation and other things. It's uh, a lot of different applications of that temporal aspect. Um, so we've also got a prototype of it in Revit uh, and we're working on uh, how does it all fit in, how does it work, but uh, the idea would be, for example, you know, um, if you've got an existing building, What's, what are the surface areas, what are the measurements if you're using it as a starting point, or let's say you've got some baseline construction, foundation, that kind of thing, you want to measure off of that. This is the kind of tool that would allow you to do that. Um, but this is a bit of a work in progress, to be honest. But this, the idea is the same, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the significance of doing it and, and what some of the issues were that we were facing. But this is absolutely one of our top priorities now that we have all of the AutoCAD kind of things. And, you know, it wouldn't work for specific uh, plant features, but this is something we've been talking about here, like water plants, airports, other facilities that can be, are, are reasonably accessible. Even, you know, like in Los Angeles, um, you know, all the canals and, and uh, waterways, drainage, um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a public roadway. Um, anywhere where you can use it to get a, a decent, legitimate scan uh, is something that is possible to do. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities here. Um, from that perspective. Are there limitations in Revit to the size of the, the physical size of the data set? I, I don't know. Well, you know, the data's real. You're, you're not, this data is not in Revit, right, per se. It's in a container that's using the cloud service to visualize it, right? So, and that's true in AutoCAD too. So, in fact, actually, one of the beautiful things that we've done about it in AutoCAD, which Sean's going to, he's just worked on the ArcGIS white paper that we're going to be showing tomorrow about some other integration issues with ArcGIS Online and how to do that. But Sean um, will be writing up a bit of a white paper, some of the technical issues in doing this. But the nice thing about AutoCAD, we leave nothing around. So that widget that moves around and, you know, the WMS uh, feature service where you're showing all the recording locations, we use um, transit, transitory graphics to do that. So we're not leaving any features in behind in your drawings or anything like that, right? We leave them completely clean at the end of it. And we're going to try to do the same thing in Revit. The only thing you're left with as an artifact is a 3D surface of that wall and a, and a proper Revit object from it. Yeah. So, uh, here we're reading, you know, measurement content and we're going to be creating in the future, it's a prototype, but an actual wall or, you know, depending upon the level of the architecture that you're, you're dealing with, the discipline and so on. There's a lot of user interface issues to that because the Revit model itself for data creation is so much more complex than the one for just vanilla, vanilla AutoCAD, really, obviously. Okay, so concluding remarks. Um, some of these are really important, I think, uh, just the sort of this project, what we learned from it uh, collectively. 3D data collection. I mean, the thing is, like, you know, this customer of ours, we've been working with them for at least, I think, eight years now. 
2D cost estimates for data conversion, the old-fashioned way, they literally come in in the, in the sort of, you know, half a million, million dollar range for one discipline, like gas, water, for the whole city, right? To vectorize, give vectorized data from all sorts of paper records and all of this stuff, right? And what's the real benefit of that after having done it? Can they engineer off that? Well, yes, but there's still uncertainty and data quality issues in that. 3D data capture is so cost effective, like a 10 to 1 difference, and I'm not joking about that, cost-wise, to collect data at the entire city scale. Of course, limitations, it's visible, it's street level and that kind of thing, sure. But 99% of infrastructure in a municipality is at street level anyway. So, you know, it is a process, not an event. And what I mean by that is a lot of data collection that takes place right now is for a project, right? The LiDAR files that get captured, the imagery that gets captured, if you're using something like Recap Photo, which is the sort of uh, photogrammetric way of getting LiDAR or, you know, point clouds anyway, that data tends to be sort of, you know, used. And then is it discarded? Is it archived? How is it accessed in the future? Is the temporal thing there? What's the metadata? So process-wise, this is a very helpful way to look at it because it changes it from just an event-based sort of project level thing to a sort of system-wide kind of change in philosophy about how you use 3D reality capture data at a scale of the city, right? And it is possible to do, and it's possible to do very cost effectively. For the price of some drones, you can get this data collected in a small city uh, scale. Uh, asset management applications are obviously incredible. Um, and it's repeatable. And the, the other thing about it is metadata, right? Like the level of metadata that you have is uh, really incredibly useful. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That's an excellent question. So the question is, um, if, if the customer collects this data, is this data being then used on public websites and that kind of thing? And I, I, Pete will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there would be anything to prohibit a municipality from using it in that way. Um, so that's, that's a very good question, and I would say that you could do that. Is that true? Uh, it is true to, to a certain extent. So I'll give you an example. Um, Assessment websites, Maricopa County in Arizona, we mentioned earlier, and Franklin County in, in Ohio, uh, their public assessor website actually has uh, a cut-down version, if you wish, of the viewer, but allows a member of the public to see exactly what the assessor is seeing and why that property was assessed with that particular uh, capture at that time. So the answer is yes. Uh, are we giving full functionality? Does a member of the public need to understand how to measure between two points? No. But, but yes and no to that answer. Yeah, likely. Yeah. So, a question. So to understand the question fully, just to repeat, and if I get it wrong, please stop me. The overlap of the camera, uh, I don't know. I can find out for you, but it's, we talked about the, we have algorithms that take, that there's quite a substantial bit of overlap between the cameras and, and the image through our algorithms. I hate using the word stitching because it isn't actually physically stitching it. There is no parallax, there is no crooked lines or crooked people. But I can get you a more definitive answer on what the overlap is. I, I truly don't know. Um, but the second part of the question was based around. I guess uh, it, it has to do with interval and range. So the, the interval at which you're taking pictures or the range at how far they actually be apart from each other to, uh, to create the proper amount of depth. So the, uh, so the we st I think we stand to <coughs> 90 feet. Uh, accuracy when it comes to sort of visualizing the asset tag on a pole, uh, which is quite, can be quite substantially distance. We, we only drive based upon clients' requirements. So we typically take an Esri shapefile, 
as the road center line, and that's what we drive. If you are a DOT or an organization with wide roads, uh, multiple directions, multiple passes, so that gives you passes in both, both directions. Um, and like I said, it's just purely based upon the client requirements. We don't go, we don't go out going crazy capturing everything. But it's, I believe it's approximately 90 feet. I should know that, and I will find out for you. But uh, there was a question about the capture interval too. That's generally quite fixed, isn't it? The capture interval is fixed every 15 feet, every five meters. That's it. No, the vehicle just carries on. That's why the vehicle, one vehicle, on average, 40 miles, linear miles per day. Uh, for the LiDAR unit, I think there's a, and I need to check on the specification, I think it's around 60. By the way, you do have that information on there. This, this question was about speed limits yeah. and uh, data collection. So that, for the LiDAR, that data is in the presentation, which will be up on the on the website for this, uh, along with Sean's little white paper about some of the tricks we did use to do this. And we typically obviously drive to the speed limit. Right, right. I didn't know that. Big smiley face when I said that. <laughs> Sir, question. So it, it's so the question around OCR, optical character recognition. By the way, raster design. If you ever seen that from Autodesk, does great OCR. I used to train that years ago. Anyway, we digress. Um, we have automated, an automated, semi-automated solution. Algorithms that actually go through the imagery because if you look at the the imagery, it's a full 360 panoramic image. So you could have a license plate that we blur in one image, but you may find the same license plate in 10 other images. So we do have algorithms specifically for uh, street signage that actually checks with the MUTC database. So we'll do a little bit of OCI, it reads stop, it checks with the database, the national database for signage, and we'll actually build that database around that. Yeah. You know, it has to be fit into a QA process as well, because yes. that, the quality of that is not as easy to define. But that, that is a proposal that is in front of the city of Alexandria right now, especially for their hydrants, right? So, and you kind of tend to have to be very specific, right? Like you can't say, find everything, find hydrants, right? That's a manageable problem that is, has a boundary that can be contained. Um, so. in, a, in a practical example, I'm finding that a lot at the moment with 5G, 5G build outs for various cities around the United States. I'm not sure if anyone's aware of this. Various engineering firms have been, uh, that have been uh, asked to do 5G permits for communication organizations. But when they talk about uh, aerial, it's everything on a utility pole because they're looking at the ownership of the pole and where they can put their assets in through to what they call underground, which is quite simply not underground in a traditional sense, is looking at a a manhole cover and reading the manhole cover to see whether it says level three AT&T because they're owned by different organizations. So using similar algorithms to go quickly, Pete, you know, let's get this information together to, to guess. Um, I've talked about the multiple sources and how they have to fit together. So, I mean, this is not a complete view. Obviously we talked about that and there, you have to complement it with other things if you want the absolute complete picture. Um, challenges. So, you know, Civil 3D and all, all the AutoCAD derivatives have a pretty consistent API and approach and it's a really well known one, really well supported APIs and that was really a lot of fun to do and, uh, you know, the, we were able to use really good techniques to do it. Um, Revit presented some unexpected challenges, so that is something that we're going to be looking at in the future to see how we can do that a little bit better. Um, there's some beautiful things about the Revit API and just in terms of plugging it in and the interfaces that are defined for it, but there's some challenges, especially because of the way 
There is no real GIS data in there. Um, so that's something we're looking at. On the InfraWorks side, it's really the API that's available today is quite limited and JavaScript focused. I don't know if there's anyone here who does have experience writing their own plugins for InfraWorks. It's something the development team tends to do. But if you do, I'd really like to talk to you because we had uh, issues with that and we were not, that was one of the products that it would go really well into. And the LiDAR can, of course, the LiDAR can absolutely go right into InfraWorks and then be used with uh, some of the new uh, web services they have for ex feature extraction and that kind of thing. So that, the LiDAR is usable inside InfraWorks, no problem. But um, getting a plug-in for InfraWorks with that same interface uh, is something that we have not been able to do. The other problem is right now, our initial spec, the LiDAR files are just too small. They're very dense, but if, as long as you're, if you're gonna be using them on a computer that's of an appropriate size, they need to be bigger even to be able to sort of fit in seamlessly at a usable level because there is a lot of data there, right? So the LiDAR itself cannot be used just willy-nilly on any kind of platform. To be used effectively, it has to be a little bit better organized. So we're working on that to make you know, about a quarter as many files, at least, um, that are, uh, you know, a little bit more usable um, in groups. Because we have to do grouping and aggregation. That's, that's a whole art of it. And then the other part of that is on the recap side, bulk processing 300,000 recap files or LES files into recap files was an enormous challenge for us just in terms of reality. There's a decap, I don't know if you folks know this, but there is a command line tool that will do it. It's called decap, it comes with recap. But um, performance of it, uh, we wrote a little, I guess it's node sort of application, Python application driver for it so it just scans all of the files that are there, tries to see if they have any data in them and then runs recap on a project level and does all that work. That was extremely time consuming. The vast majority of time in the project was actually that part of the process, the post-processing of the uh, captured LiDAR files. <clears throat> now, this is, we didn't talk about this really, how is this deployed? All that data is in the cloud. So that panoramic imagery uh, is in the cloud and it's all available. The LiDAR is typically shipped up until recently on disk to you as a customer, which is useful and that probably is something that we'll still be able to do. But they're putting in place an on-demand cloud service for the LiDAR data as well, which is really convenient because you can go out and get it as needed. Um, and depending upon your bandwidth and everything like that, you can get it for a certain area and then process the recap files on the fly and load them. But uh, the, the, interestingly enough, the recap DCAP part of the project was by far the most uh, difficult for us to manage. Um, so that's something we're going to be trying to talk to the Autodesk recap team about. So, you know, to get a, just better improvement. I think they now support LAZ directly, so you can just load an LAZ file, whereas it used to be LAS. Um, so that should improve it. Um, but we'd like to get something a little bit more reliable even than that. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you pick, you're actually selecting a point from the LiDAR point cloud, or is it back to photogrammetric effort? I mean, I don't know the precise answer for that. I'll let Pete answer that one, because it's a bit of both, actually. Yes. Right. So it's, well, it's, no, sort, it's, of, it's <laughs> sort of, under, the way I understand it, and if, if Peter and I may not be able to give you the right answer, we have to go get it. But the question is, the, the, when measuring, what is the sort of source of measurement? Is it just photogrammetric calculation off the image? or is it from the LiDAR or what? And the answer is it's a bit of both. So the, if you've got the LiDAR collection, there's an algorithm that is using some of that data in the backend processing to underpin the measurement with the LiDAR data so you can get elevations and those kinds of things. But I don't know the details. Um, but behind the scenes, what it's doing is actually taking triangulation from three different recording locations. So you pick a point, somewhere on the screen, it's actually going off, finding that other point from two other recording locations, giving that triangulation so you're actually getting the correct point, not just picking a point in some random area. Have Two quick follow-ups to that is, what is your accuracy again, approximate? Uh, positional accuracy is sub four inches. That can be tightened up with uh, ground, uh, ground stations. X, Y, and Z? Yes. And uh, measurement accuracy is sub-inch, it's 19 millimeters that we stand to. 
So I'm sorry about the one point, the one point nine, yeah, nineteen millimeters. That's what half inch. Yeah, right, just over. If, a little bit more than that. Yeah. yeah, a little over a half inch. It's confusing. You're saying that the accuracy of the data is sub four inch, but measurement. Position ac position accuracy. So relative think, position accuracy. Yeah. Okay. And the final question is that line that I never thought I'd ever see is lidar files are too small. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's the size they're captured at. So um, they're, they're in, in Europe, they're more manageable because they're 50 meters in size. In North America, until recently, they were, they were 50 feet in size. A 50-foot LiDAR file isn't the most useful thing uh, when you're using it inside a design tool, to be honest. 50 feet at a street level is just barely, it's not even a, a block, you know what I mean? So from that point of view, they are, quite seriously, they're too small to be really a practical use. Because then what you have to do is in your recap file, and we have a tool that helps you navigate that. So we have a tool that shows you what LiDAR files are available. And we have to sort of bundle them together to make them come in in a way that they actually look meaningful and can be used for design. So, but, and that is a problem because, you know, but then in, once you've got the, the, it loaded and, re, and AutoCAD with recap files, one of the virtues of recap as a format Autodesk products do incredible things with them. Like once it's in AutoCAD with, re with the recap data that's behind it, you know, setting the level of uh, detail, setting colors, you know, all of the, you know, that kind of thing is really easy to do. Um, so performance can be tweaked essentially for you and you can do surface and other kinds of things with it, with the uh, point cloud toolbar that is right in AutoCAD. So, um, but yeah, f 50 feet is too small. So I think it's 150 feet now that you're doing, which is closer to the, three, the three, uh, 50 meters, I believe so, which yeah. is done in Europe. You mentioned, you mentioned um, API. Yeah. Is there, is there some sort of API to be able to work? Because that form that pops up in AutoCAD. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Street Smart uh, tool has a fully supported API. That is what we used to do it, and uh, it's actually great. I mean, we've worked with them a lot on it because AutoCAD, using it in AutoCAD events and threading and all that stuff caused a lot of problems. Sean could talk to you about some of that, and we do plan to put up with the, the rest of the, with the PowerPoint, which will be up on the AU website, a little white paper on some of the details. Not all of them, of course, but uh, a handful of them. Are you guys are doing the expo, or? Yeah, we are. Sorry. The repeat, question was, are we at the expo? Yes. <coughs> yeah. Up. Down. Yeah. It's full 180, 360. Yeah. I shouldn't say this. The normal reaction I get when we show this is, wow. <laughs> because because you're, you're reading asset tags on the side of a transformer from about, I don't know, 100 feet away. Well, and the co I, I will say, like, cost effect, you know, like it is, we're now at the point where the tools and the data and the data processing on the back end, and this is, you know, people complain about the cloud and everything like that, and for some, you know, security, all the issues that are around it, but this is one of the better uses of cloud technology I've seen, because the volumes of data are something you don't want to store internally. You don't want to have to install a server for this and manage it yourself and everything like that and create a whole sort of ecosystem internally around that. This is just a service that you use. Yeah. We, to be able to back it up through not the type of litigation that you're talking about, but if you were to rectify an alignment on a roadway design uh, for a DOT, uh, there are different standard practices that we would have to follow or, or verify that. So with, without repeating the question, but I think my statement is going to hopefully help answer the question, and we call it professional grade imagery you are still going to need your PE, your professional engineer, to have that stamp. Do we do ADA compliance, look at the imagery, imagery and that's ADA compliant? No, it's still going to require a professional engineer say, hey, that doesn't comply. But what you can get with that level of accuracy and a high level of confidence, that's the whole point, because you've got a source of truth, high level of confidence what's going on there, then make that decision. But you're absolutely right, it's going to require that professional 
And using professional tools from ESRI or Autodesk to actually use very happy Esri customers that actually have the imagery embedded into an ArcGIS based solution. And they're using the imagery as a source of truth to validate the data they've already had in there. And respectfully to our Esri customers, the old joke, you know what GIS stands for? Yeah, and one thing that's important too <laughs> get, is get it, it, it is transparent about the quality you're getting. So that's important actually. Yes. So you can tell what your level of confidence is. That's got the sigma on each point as part of your measurement. So if you're measuring a line or like that curve, uh, you're getting, and the curve, we, we actually do create curves from it, arcs. We don't just create, you know, interpolated points. Um, but the, uh, you're getting, you know what the measurement inaccuracies are. Mm -hmm. So that's also incredibly valuable. But you're totally right, and it's not a criticism, really, as I see it. Yeah, so didn't take it as totally a criticism. Totally fair point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No, no, it's just that it's transparent about the accuracy you have. So, in other words, it reports out as you're doing your measurement for every point what the level of accuracy is and the, and the standard deviation of that too. Yeah, so, so technical consideration, the question around sort of tightening up the positional accuracy from ground control points, yes. So clients like the city of New York will supply that and we can tighten up the imagery even further. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much, folks.